You know, I'm not surprised that considering the president and his executive fiats, but using the Department of Justice to do an in-run around Congress to in for, to implement his gun control agenda that he wasn't able to do through Congress. How can the DOJ do this? And, and what's more, why is no one in the administration or anyone in Washington, D.C. saying, well, the DOJ doesn't make law. They are just there to enforce what's already written and hand out uh, legal decisions on this. Where, where do we go with this? Well, your last question, the reason nobody at DOJ is doing that is because they don't like guns. I mean, most of the people who work at the Justice Department in downtown D.C., it's called the RFK building, uh, remember, there's a Beltway culture. A uh, lot of them come from Maryland, Chevy Chase, uh, 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 Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, Alexandria. There's a culture inside the Beltway that is hostile to First Am Second Amendment rights. And so the reason nobody's protesting is because they don't like guns. Yeah. Now, your first question, uh, how can they just make law? How are they doing this? Don't forget, the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, falls under the Justice Department. And the ATF is responsible for various federal databases regarding criminal conviction. They're feeding data into statewide verification checks. So when you go buy a firearm, uh, ultimately they're peering into federal data. And if that federal data are showing that somebody has a mental problem mm. uh, or a, a psychiatric history of treatment, the federal government gets to manipulate the data. Yeah. They get to decide what the data show. Yeah, and that's and what's disturbing is that we've known that we've seen how this is used against veterans. Uh, and then most recently, with the New York SAFE Act, we're actually the largest number at once, 34,000 people just immediately like that, rendered ineligible to exercise their Second Amendment rights because they had just sought some mental health, mental wellness visits with a psychologist or something uh, in the past year. And that to me, uh, Christian, is, is, I find that incredibly scary because they're using such a blanket term. I mean, just because someone maybe has depression or someone has PTS, that, that's an assumed danger, not a real one. Yeah, and look, I have experience with real danger with mental patients and mental people getting firearms. And we don't want paranoid schizophrenics uh, to own guns, right. period, because right. they kill people. Uh, this is a question, though, not about paranoid schizophrenics, but this is a question about uh, people who go seek counseling. Uh, maybe they have flashbacks from a combat experience, something like that. The government is using any chance they can to get these people on the do not sell list, cannot buy list. Because don't forget, this government fears veterans. Mm -hmm. We've seen it coming out of DHS, Department of Homeland Security, issuing their right wing uh, domestic yeah. terror reports that focuses on veterans. This is an integrated program, Dana, to limit Second Amendment rights. And the other rule, because they always say that they're going to come up with regulations, they're always incredibly vague about it. And these are really the only two more concrete things that we know. And the other one was the ATF. They're wanting the ATF to modify this rule about misdemeanor domestic assault, which, you know, I'm all for because I, you know, with my family experience that I've outlined in my book, I mean, it was an estranged family member that had been assaulting his, his estranged wife that could have taken us all out. So I'm all fine with a domestic abuser uh, not having, being able to obtain a firearm. But the problem that I see with them wanting to redefine this is that they want to use a blanket term instead of defining it case by case. So I gave the example that if you have a woman in her house who has her estranged husband or her abusive husband in her face screaming at her and she shoves him, he tells the cop she shoves him, that right there could be domestic, uh, a misdemeanor domestic assault and she could be rendered ineligible to get a firearm to defend herself. I mean, what's give us the problem, you know, from, a, from your legal perspective with what they're wanting the ATF to do in the modification of this rule. Well, the biggest problem is the Constitution. Don't forget, the states have the power to deal with this issue. I was just looking recently at some Pennsylvania rules on ineligibility to possess a firearm, and the states have their own regime. The states have their own rules, and that's the way under our Constitution it ought mm -hmm. to be. But having bureaucrats in Washington deciding what sort of misdemeanor might render you ineligible to purchase a firearm is exactly the wrong way to do it. It's exactly the anti-constitutional way to do it because people cannot overestimate the radical nature of the culture inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C.